Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Adam Haston. I'm co-founder and the head of data science here at Darcia Data and Analytics. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon for our Community Connection event, um, the second event I think that we've run so far. Uh, the first event, uh, we had a smattering of um, more hardcore data science type of stuff, and that got a lot of interest and a lot of excitement for some folks. And so we thought we'd have a follow-up dedicated to um, more data science and, uh, and, and data and machine learning type of work. Um, this afternoon, we've got joining us Sarah Barker, who's uh, the Director of Innovation at the um, Innovation Lab at our community. Um, her work um, has been instrumental in um, embedding machine learning and AI techniques and techniques in data science, data analytics with their Smarty Grants um, application service that many of you will be familiar with. Um, so she's going to talk, talk to us a little bit about that work and um, another work that she's been doing in this space along those lines. So I'll pass to Sarah. Thank you so much. Thanks, Adam, for the introduction. Uh, as Adam mentioned, I'm the head of innovation at our community. That involves um, a couple of things. One is I lead a data science team that analyzes the data that flows through some of the systems that we manage, particularly Smarty Grants. Um, there are about a million grant applications in there, um, obviously very text heavy um, data that we're looking at in there. Um, we also manage other systems like givenow.com.au um, and the Funding Center. And we work with both sides of the coin. So we work with grant makers um, who are using Smarty Grants um, or also who, um, you know, grab best practice toolkits and things that we provide for grant making. Um, and that's government and philanthropy. Um, and then we also work with not-for-profits. So as well as the work that we do with grant makers, um, our community is really set up as a spot that not-for-profits can go for help. We have a lot of information about fundraising, governance, insurance, banking, um, all the things that you need um, to set up a um, successful community group um, or a not-for-profit uh, and also get funding and, and um, you know, run healthy organizations and build stronger communities. So we do a lot of things uh, with both sides of the, of the equation. Um, before I get really get stuck into it, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the edge of Nam here in Melbourne. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to Wurundjeri people um, and elders past, present and emerging around the country. Um, so I've got a lot to cover. I am going to try and keep it to about 15 minutes. Um, some of these topics are a little bit mind bending. And I talk about artificial intelligence, um, but as Adam mentioned, um, we also talk a lot about data science. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the relationship between the two. And then I'm going to talk about some applications um, that lend themselves to using artificial intelligence or data science in the social sector. Some of these may be things that um, are not really practical in your organisation in terms of the you know, investment and, and skill sets and tools that you would need to enable them. So this is really just um, whetting your appetite, I guess, getting you thinking about what might be applicable in your organization. Um, and also, you know, what people are sort of looking at at the bigger end of town. So the bigger not-for-profits, um, health organizations, international development, those sorts of um, organizations. Um, but I will also talk a little bit about just doing better with data. Um, and we have a lot of resources for that, um, which I can link to at the end of the talk as well. So let's get stuck in. Okay. So this is a little um, favorite piece of footage of mine of this little um, robot on a bike. Uh, so what do we mean by AI? Well, um, basically we're talking about um, uh, using machines or using code that can mimic human behavior. So it can think like a human. And I think that really boils down into two things. It's, it means you can ask AI a question and it can give you a reasonable answer, um, or you can ask it to do something for you. Now, this little robot here, you know, he seems friendly, he's pretty good on a bike, um, but he's pretty far from being a useful addition to your team. Um, so this footage is actually 10 years old. Um, things have come a long way since then, and there's been a lot of investment in, in these sorts of robots. Um, but as you've seen, there's also a lot of investment in other types of artificial intelligence. And, you know, things are really coming at our fingertips now in terms of Siri and Alexa, um, things that our phones can do. Um, I have a robot vacuum at home that's pretty, pretty useful. Um, and then obviously driverless vehicles, you know, robotics in um, factories and those sorts of things. So things have come a long way. Um, 
So let's look at, uh, I guess, a bit more about, you know, what is artificial intelligence? So I talked about robots, um, but it doesn't have to be a physical robot. You know, it can be algorithms or models um, that learn from data. Um, you can feed data and it can it do something either useful for you or it can give you valuable insights. But there is this broader field of data science. Um, and I think about that in a couple of ways. One is that a lot of the techniques in data science are needed in order to enable these artificial intelligence um, tools and techniques to happen. So it's a much broader field. Um, it is needed to enable AI, but it's also valuable in itself. And there may be aspects of this you're already doing. So statistical analysis or doing some reporting, um, processing data, that sort of thing. So you may not think about that as, um, as AI, um, but obviously it's a building block and it's valuable in itself. And let's face it, not many small not-for-profits or community groups are anywhere near building AI, but we still strongly believe that if you can do more with your data, um, then you can do things faster, smarter, better. Um, and that's sort of gearing towards having some of these capabilities that we would hope AI would do for us. So let's think about um, data in your organisation. And this is a framework we've um, developed and uh, there is actually a document available that you can download that goes into this in more detail. Um, but it talks you through what you can do with data. And it starts with really collecting and storing um, good quality data. So um, we have tutorials around that about how to do um, better data collection and um, check your data for good quality. And then moving up from there, the ability to process and explore that data. So being able to you know, navigate around the data, ask it questions, um, look for insights, those sorts of things in, in kind of an ad hoc fashion, but at least having it in a state that you can actually explore it, having um, tools available that you can go in and have a look and see what's happening. From there, you really need to be able to um, report and visualize the data. So this is being able to look for trends, look for patterns, um, understand what's happening and also communicate that. So being able to um, create visualizations or stories um, where the data is actually um, conveying something with meaning. And then from there, the next level up is really looking at this learning and optimization. And that's really where this data science kicks in. This is really where um, you can start to gather really um, deep insights about what might be happening. You might be running experiments to, to see, um, you know, what, what's the cause and effect there. Um, and also looking to optimise. So trying to, you know, get maximum um, impact um, and optimise your results. I also refer to this um, level as the Asians, and we're going to drill into those a bit today. Um, so this is where you can look at, you know, automation, optimization, recommendations and personalization. And they're the things that we're going to go into um, in a bit more detail. Okay. Um, and I will also say again, some of this is useful in its own right. Um, it's not that you really need to be aiming towards data science and AI. Um, you know, it may be that you're really just trying to collect and store better data so that you can do a, a, you know, a, a, a better annual report, for example. That's all really good capability to have um, to unlock insights and get that data working for you. Okay, so uh, let's launch into automation. So this is really around reducing the overheads of manual work. So in the social sector, there are a few applications of this. Um, a really good example is claims processing. So if it, there's a not-for-profit um, sort of health, in, health provider, for example, um, they may have a claims process. So being able to build tools to automate some of that process and reduce some of the manual work. Um, we see that as um, in grants as well. So for example, um, grant makers have a lot of eligibility checks for their grants. Um, often they have rules around how often you can apply for a grant. Um, so duplicate checks come into play. Um, so that, that sort of, um, you know, checking and, um, and so on is a really good spot to start in terms of automation. The other areas you can look at is things that are triggered by um, particular um, keywords and so on. So you could set up, for example, some automation around your emails. Um, if you had a support email address and people mention particular words, you could point them towards frequently asked questions, for example, automatically um, as those emails come in. Um, if you have a Microsoft 365 um, subscription, that's something that you could actually set up um, fairly easily um, if you're looking to cut down sort of the manual overheads of responding to emails. 
Um, in the Smarter Grants world, um, one area of, uh, that we're automating quite heavily is in grants classification. So we've built a tool that can read a grant application and um, tell you whether it is um, related to a particular subject, so arts or education or health, and also what beneficiary group um, that grant application serves. So is it a grant targeted towards, um, you know, supporting women, um, supporting First Nations Australians, um, supporting people with disability and so on. Um, and you can imagine that this tool is very powerful for us um, as Smarty Grants because it means we can auto classify the full grants database and there's a million grants in there. Um, that just wouldn't be possible to do by hand. And um, if you're working with um, clients, for example, um, or you're getting surveys about the programs and services that you're offering, um, you know, the ability to auto classify um, those responses can be really powerful. Um, because that way you can then do sort of topic modelling or thematic analysis and, and see, you know, what are the common responses that people are coming back with. So in a Smarty Grant sense, um, the ability to auto classify all of the grants means that we can start to look at well, where is the money going. So this is um, a project that we're working on at the moment um, where we're trying to under understand the funding flows through Smarty Grants. So we're trying to see, you know, where's the money going? Um, is it mostly in in the arts? Is it mostly in health? Is it mostly in science and so on? And also, you know, where is the unmet demand? So you can see here that we've got, um, you know, many, many, many more funds requested than funds allocated. Um, so that really indicates a shortfall where people are applying for a grant and, and not getting the funding. So that's one area of analysis that we can do across Smarty Grants. And then we can also slice it by grant maker type and so on. Um, and then in Smarty Grants itself, we can be playing that data back to the individual grant makers so they can see where their money's going. Um, we can also look at um, not just where the funding's going, but also approval rates. So we can also see um, which grants are more or less likely to be successful um, because we can auto classify by beneficiary group, for example. So um, this is an interesting chart, well, we find it interesting anyway, that it seems that still um, funding to directed towards women um, is less likely to be approved than funding directed towards men, um, which to me seems completely backwards. Um, so uh, these are the sorts of statistics that we're pulling out. Um, and then we can play that back to grant makers and they can really dig into what's going on and whether there needs to be some sort of adjustment there. So it can hopefully really drive some action um, and, and thinking about sort of inclusion and equity and so on. Okay, the other um, area where um, auto classification can be really useful is for things like rapid response grants. So um, we saw in 2020 with the bushfires and then again with COVID, um, there was a real push for grant makers to get money out the door quickly. So being able to auto classify grant applications as they come in and then particularly, you know, pull out particular ones based on some of the, the labelling that's happening um, can be really powerful in surfacing those applications first so they can go through assessment um, quicker and get, get payments out the door. Um, in Smarty Grants, um, not using this particular tool, but um, we did have some um, grant rounds. Uh, there was one grant round that opened on a Thursday, um, had 1,600 applications come in and then made 1,200 um, payments by the Friday. Um, so this is a sort of, you know, rapid response that they're trying to get. So you can imagine, you know, being able to automate um, some of the um, analysis that's going on in the background and really be able to surface um, eligibility checks and, um, and classifications and things can be really powerful. So we're not quite there yet. Um, these rapid response grants were more, um, you know, we're not using these tools, but uh, this is really what we're trying to, to bring into Smarty Grants. Um, and again, thinking about that from a um, not-for-profit perspective, you know, thinking about requests that are coming in um, and being able to respond to those quicker is really the, the aim of the game here. Okay, so let's look at optimization. So really um, what I've talked about so far with automation is all about efficiency. So optimization is really more around effectiveness. So how do you use data to become more effective? Um, so the first area is really in needs analysis. So really understanding the community that you're trying to serve um, and tools like SEER data are very, very useful in this space. So being able to pull in um, public or open data sets, um, social data sets, health indicators, um, unemployment figures, migration figures, and those sorts of things 
um, and really understanding um, the community you're serving and, and the needs that they have. Um, and this was uh, came through in an event we ran last year um, with Community Hubs Australia. So they are a um, not-for-profit organisation um, that provides programs and services for new migrant families and their kids and uh, referrals onto other um, services that are suitable. They also do English language training, um, play groups and um, lots of sort of community building activities. So we worked with them um, on an event where we got uh, 50 data scientists and data analysts together uh, for a weekend um, who then split up into teams and then worked for the course of the month. Um, to crunch the data and, and look at where community hubs could uh, potentially launch new hubs. Um, and that was pulling in a lot of those, those data sets I mentioned earlier around, um, you know, migration figures and socioeconomic factors. Um, so SEER data would have been very useful in this space. We weren't using SEER at the time, um, but, uh, you know, that, that's really a, a really good use of, um, of SEER. Um, Cool, cool. So the other um, end of the coin is um, you understand the community need, you design your programs and services, um, and then you want to understand what impact you're having. So that's another area where crunching the data can really help. Um, and I've got an example here um, from a project that we did with Task Force Community Services here in Melbourne. Um, they provide alcohol and other drugs counselling um, to vulnerable people in Southeast Melbourne. And we helped them crunch some of their data and some of this they'd never really looked into before. So they'd done a bit of, um, a bit of counting before for annual reporting and so on. Um, they did a lot of mandatory reporting through to government, but they hadn't really um, visualized and crunched their data um, to really try and get insights out of it. So we worked with them to do a bit of that. Um, and you could clearly see um, just by looking at their contacts, their youth contacts, that there was a big jump um, as a result of, contact, uh, of COVID in their phone contacts. Um, so as a result of this um, project, they um, task force then applied for some grant funding to launch a telehealth program um, and being able to really you know, demonstrate um, and use the data as evidence um, that there was a real need for um, remote contacts. Um, was really helpful in, in getting that grant funding and launching their telehealth program. We also looked at their um, self-reported outcomes data. So they collect self-reported outcomes against psychological health, physical health and quality of life um, and hadn't really done this level of statistical analysis to see whether um, their programs were really resulting in a, in a bump or a shift. So we were able to um, crunch that data for them um, and you can see here that there is um, evidence that they, their programs are successful um, on average in creating um, positive outcomes for their client base. What was interesting is that we then took that a step further and started to look at breakdowns um, by gender, by drug, drug of choice, by age and so on. Um, and this was particularly interesting when we did the gender analysis, you could see that um, the results uh, for men and for women were not comparable. Um, and there may be different reasons for that. So it may be that um, the programs aren't as effective um, for women as they are for men. They may not have been designed with women involved as much as, as men. Or it may be that there's differences in the way that men and women self-report. For example, um, men may be more inclined to um, report immediate um, changes based on, you know, reduced um, drug usage, for example, um, whereas for women, it may be a slower burn, you know, they may um, sort of reflect outcomes based on longer term factors, such as their relationships with their family and, and so on. So um, we can't really explain through the data, this data, um, what the reasons for this are. Um, is it a, a difference in the way they experience the programs or is it a difference in the way that they report their outcomes? Um, but certainly there seems to be a, a gender split there. Um, so since then, um, my understanding is task force has been looking at um, bringing in more diversity expertise to look at some of their program design. Um, this report is fully available on their website if you want to go and have a look at that. Um, and if you want to chat to us about this project and how you might do something similar, um, you know, come and chat to us so we can provide some advice on that. Um, cool. So I'll also say that as well as not-for-profits trying to assess their impact, um, grant makers are trying to do that as well. Um, they have the extra challenge of having to roll up across uh, lots and lots and lots of grantees. 
So at Smarty Grants, we've been doing a lot of work with grant makers um, to work out how to collect impact data in a sensible way um, so that it can be rolled up and, and they can look at um, monitoring um, change and, and reported lessons learned and so on across their grant programs. Okay, so the next um, area I'd like to talk about is recommendations. And this is really, again, where um, the, the data science and AI can really be powerful, is really deciding what to do next. So a lot of reporting and analysis is really looking at the past, what's happened already, um, you know, what is the data telling us? Recommendations is really about, you know, predicting um, the future or predicting the next best outcome. So one of these areas that we've looked at, um, again, in terms of grants is in grant assessment. So um, looking at a grant application, should we approve it? Should we decline it? So I'm not gonna go into this in a lot of detail um, because it's a whole area in itself um, because there's a lot of ethical implications about building these types of tools. So they need to be designed with humans in mind. Um, the impacts on people um, really need to be factored in. Um, and you need to think about the people that will be working with the tool as well. So, for example, we need to be really careful not to design tools um, that just replicate past behaviour. If there's particular niche areas that weren't funded in the past, we'd hate for the machine to continually say, no, nope, don't fund those grants because, um, you know, that's based on past behaviour. Um, because if there's flaws in the data or um, a problem with the algorithm, then obviously, um, you know, that would be replicated into future decisions, which would, wouldn't be desirable. So this is an area we're heavily researching and really thinking through, um, you know, we, we don't actually want to automate grant assessment, but what we want to do is provide tools that make lo the life easier for um, human assessors. So that's an area that we're continuing to research. Um, Another, I guess, example um, more from a not-for-profit organisation that I heard about in the US was that um, an algorithm was being used to assess the suitability of services that an agency could provide um, to clients um, who were presenting asking for help. Um, and in some cases, the algorithm um, would respond that the agency's services were not suitable. So um, this implementation on the whole was not successful. Um, and because, as you can imagine, experienced caseworkers um, weren't prepared to turn people away, um, even though the algorithm said so, um, when people were presenting in a crisis. Um, so you really, if you're thinking about, you know, implementing sort of uh, these tools that are making decisions, um, you really have to think about the interplay between the humans and the machines. Um, otherwise, it's, it's not going to work or you're going to have potentially some really negative outcomes there. Um, the other area uh, in terms of recommendations is around matching. So this is not too dissimilar to algorithms that you might have experienced yourself when you're watching Netflix. Um, so it uses your um, watching preferences and also um, what titles you've watched already um, to predict or recommend um, what you should watch next. It's also very much used in social dating apps, um, trying to find matches um, for people, you know, on, on Tinder and other sites. So um, in social, the social sector, this can apply in terms of um, matching people to social services um, and also very much in the grant space, matching not-for-profits and um, potential funders as well. So that's an area that we're really heavily um, looking into is um, how do we potentially create tools where if you're looking for grant funding, um, there's recommendations coming to you that are actually really, really um, uh, relevant to the work that you're trying to do and have high approval rates as well for the work that you're trying to do. And that leads me on to talking about personalization. So um, you can imagine in if you've experienced this in the retail space, there's a lot of investment in the retail space at the moment about really creating that personalized experience for you um, as you shop. Um, that can be very much translated into the social sector in terms of clients trying to access help um, and really creating personalised um, experiences and journeys through um, social services. So I think there's really a direct translation there into the social sector. Um, but what we really haven't seen is that level of investment and, and tooling and infrastructure and so on to make, make it happen. Um, so one example is um, really just starting off with segmenting um, your 
donor base or your client base, for example, and really understanding if those segments have different needs and starting to, to tailor to those. So even tailoring um, communications towards your donors based on their segment um, can be really powerful. Another area um, is risk assessments. So there was an example in the US where data was um, used to determine what kids were at risk of dropping out of high school before graduation. And the algorithm didn't actually do anything or suggest anything um, off the back of that. All it did was um, sort of flag kids that are at risk. And then in doing that, it meant that the staff could provide extra support around, um, around that student. And they did see a, re a resultant drop in the number of people um, leaving high school before graduating. So that could be translated as well into counselling services, for example. Um, you could have a tool that really um, measures the risk of someone exiting um, prior to finishing their treatment and potentially provide a bit more support around those people to try and get them to, to see the treatment through. Another area is what's called next best action. Um, so again, this is another way of personalising your services um, based on the journey that the client's had so far. Um, and the, the system understanding, well, based on where they are at their journey, what's the next best thing we should offer them? So again, that could be for your donors um, or for your clients or for um, anyone that you're serving. Another area is um, client voice. So how do you use data to offer more choice and control um, over how people engage with you and your organisation? Um, that can be a really tricky one um, because um, it depends on the level of control that you can enable that person to have. Um, and it's also a really tricky one in terms of, you know, how do you collect that data that's meaningful without bordering on surveilling someone as well. So an example was we were looking at that um, as a potential project with a um, family and child services um, provider in their residential care unit. Obviously, if you want them to have more choice and control over their um, their journey through residential care. You need to collect a lot more information about their hopes and dreams and ambitions. Um, but you know, it may be that the young people don't necessarily want to share that, that information um, with their caseworker and so on. So there's a lot of um, you know really interesting research that can be done in that space, um, both on the tech side, but also um, you know really understanding um, that that domain and really understanding how to engage with those clients meaningfully and and ethically as well. Um, longer term, we can envision a world where, um, you know, people have really personalised journeys um, when they need help. Um, and obviously, it's relying on a lot more than just data and data science. Uh, there needs to be changes to funding structures, um, data sharing, protecting privacy and so on. But it's something to think about. Okay, so in general, uh, we're talking about using data to help social sector organisations be um, more efficient, more effective more data driven, so based on evidence, not just a hunch, and also unlocking that potential I mentioned to be faster, smarter, better, but also human centred. So we're trying to equip both people in funders and not-for-profits to make better decisions. And the goal is not just to build a robot and um, make it, let it make all our decisions for us. That's obviously not the goal. Um, we need people involved every step of the way to make sure things are done fairly and people are treated with dignity and respect. So um, that's a lot of information to cover in, uh, in the time that, that we've, we've, I've been speaking to you. But if any of these topics are of interest um, to you, please do reach out. Um, if you go to that um, Innovation Lab website there, um, you can find uh, a bunch of resources that are um, either cheap or free. Um, we offer tutorials to help uh, you build up a better understanding of the data capability in your organisation. And we also have a 15 step project guide that you can download with um, tools and templates and things in there as well to help you embark on data projects. So thanks for your time today and I'll hand back to Adam. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was fascinating. Um, so everybody, um, I'll invite you all and Kat has posted just a little prompt in the chat to let you know that if you've got questions that have come to mind, um, drop them into the chat and, uh, and we can get Sarah to answer them uh, live just now. Um, and I think probably, um, you know, while you guys might all be uh, sort of thinking about the questions that you might have, um, perhaps Kat, could we, um, could we bring up the poll? We've got a couple of polls that we want to run um, throughout this session. And so we'll bring up the first one and let you all uh, respond to that poll while thinking about your questions. Um, and I might uh, take this opportunity while everybody's um, busy thinking about that and doing that um, to ask you a couple of questions that I had that I uh, that came to me. 
Um, I'm really interested in um, the work you've done around the Smarty Grants and the Classy Fire um, work, uh, particularly where it involves natural language processing. That's always um, very, seen like very much of a black art, even among uh, you know, data science practitioners. Uh, I'd love to know how you guys came up, come up with the topics that you classify uh, applications against. Is it, are they hand featured, engin hand engineered features, or are they auto extracted through uh, unsupervised learning methods? Uh, maybe you could share a little bit about how you guys go about uh, some of that. Yeah, so that's a really good question, Adam. And um, actually, the taxonomy came first, and then the classifier um, or tool that auto classifies came second. Um, so this started quite a long time ago. Uh, my colleague, Kathy, Kathy Richardson, who's the deputy CEO and chaos controller of our community, um, went on an Eisenhower fellowship to the US in 2014 um, and really came back with lots of ideas from that. And one of the big gaps that she saw in Australia was there was no good taxonomy for classifying um, anything social sector related, really, um, grants or, or other or, you know, projects and, and so on. So, and, and organizations and, and, and more. So um, she did some research at the time to look around for good taxonomies and came across one from the US um, called the PCS taxonomy. Um, at the time it was from Foundation Center, but they've now merged into another organization called Candid um, in the US. Um, and so we then did a lot of work uh, and did a lot of investment in adapting that for Australia. So farming out bits of it um, to different sector ex experts and getting them to review it and, and, and seeing what was different. Um, some of it is pretty straightforward mechanics stuff, like with things like, you know, in the US, you're not an adult until you're 21. In Australia, it's 18, you know, those sorts of things that were fairly straightforward. Um, obviously, um, looking at some of the areas around um, Indigenous Australians um, is, a, is a bigger um, review. And then we, a bit, a couple of years later, we then um, did a similar exercise with New Zealand as well. So we actually have an Australian version and a New Zealand version. Um, so the taxonomy came first. Um, what we've found though, is that in building the auto classifier, there's been a feedback loop. So there's been things that the machine found it really hard to understand. Um, and that's actually fed into improvements in the um, taxonomies. Um, and also just, you know, interrogating it to that level of detail has raised a lot of questions and that, and, you know, factors into um, improvements as well. So the subjects taxonomy, I think, has about 900 categories that are in a hierarchy with four levels. Um, and so, you know, for example, arts and culture then breaks down into, say, festivals and events and, you know, things like that. Um, and then the beneficiaries taxonomy, I think, has between two and 300 um, different populations in there as well. Um, so it's a continually moving um, taxonomy as well. And if people have feedback on it, um, then we're, we're all ears. And that can be found from uh, ourcommunity.com.au slash classy if you look for that online. Yeah, be sure to check that one out. That's awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I can see the results of the polling have come through. Uh, I think what I need to do is click the end polling. Oh, no, there we go. Cat's not for me. Thank you for that. Um, so three, three out of our um, seven respondents saying optimization um, is the, the area that uh, data science and AI is most relevant for in their, organi in their organization. Um, so that's yeah, a natural response, I, I imagine, that uh, people would be, um, would be interested in how they can make their lives easier in their organizations. Um, again, if anybody has any questions they want to jump in with, please do. But otherwise, I'll, I'll officially satisfy my own curiosities. Um, the other the other thing that leapt out with me, um, so as you were describing some of your work, uh, particularly looking at uh, those regression analyses between uh, the time that somebody had had been engaging with a particular service and they're likely, uh, you know, responding or, or self-reporting of, of benefit uh, over that history. That's really um, that's fascinating work. We've done a little bit of that ourselves, and it's always as I'm going through that kind of um, data storytelling and, and, and extracting those insights. Um, it's often that in my mind, uh, you know, ideas are leaping out for you know, a model that could predict this or, or that might be able to prescribe the, as I think you said, the next best action uh, type of uh, recommendation. Um, was there, uh, were there any opportunities like that that occurred to you through that work um, that you did or didn't pursue? And if not, um, why not? 
Yeah, look, loads, loads and loads of ideas. Um, in fact, one thing, because I've been leading this innovation lab since uh, about, well, it depends on when you start, but about 2016, 2017, um, I was never really in an innovation space before. And one thing that we've definitely proven is once you really focus on innovating, then the ideas start coming and then you end up with more ideas than you, you can do anything with. So, um, yeah, loads of ideas around um, personalization and prediction. Um, you can imagine it with the world with perfect information that if you had um, challenges um, in life in general, um, but in particular with alcohol and other drugs, being able to come to an agency and the agency being able to tell you, you know, exactly what treatment is going to lead to the best outcome, um, you know, how often you should meet, there's tailored services, um, you're, you're monitored in a responsible and ethical way uh, with feedback to yourself and with the agency in terms of, you know, how you're going through that treatment. I mean, that would be wonderful, I think. And also being able to access other, you know, wraparound care services, um, you know, if you're experiencing homelessness or, or domestic violence or um, mental illness or, or those sorts of things, which is often the case. Um, and then having all of those, you know, services readily available and connected up. Like this is, this is the utopia, right? Um, but uh, the reality is it's very fractured. Um, the reality is that everyone's very um, time poor. And so we need to strike that balance between building tools that help with that, but not building them in such a way that they're harmful. Um, and that is a real risk. So you can imagine too, that if you, um, you know, collected a whole bunch of bright sparks, um, fresh grads out of data science school um, and got them in to build a tool, um, and they weren't grounded with the expertise or the experts didn't understand what was being built, um, or you were building it off um, flawed or biased data. And frankly, all data is biased. Um, for a start, we live in a, you know, in a patriarchy. So even if we had perfect data based on our current world, is that the world that we want to propagate into the future? You've, you know, you've got questions about that. So um, look, these are big ideas. Um, but really, you need to you need to embed that expertise into the into the work, and it all is always very. Um, it's not a one size fits all by any means. So what might work in southeast Melbourne, if we were working with task force, may not translate to regional Victoria. Even may not translate to you know to other areas. Um, so uh, yeah, it is a big investment, I think, um, and it, it needs that that expertise and the tech working together. That's fantastic. Thank you. Sorry, I, I think I've just shared the results or I'm not sharing the results. I hope that everyone was able to see the results of that polling. I'll try and make sure that I get that um, viewable straight away next time. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit new to uh, managing and running polls through Zoom. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I think you're absolutely right. And the communication, you know, communication is, is the, the, um, the underemphasized strength of, of data science. It's, it's so important. Um, as is, um, you know, empowerment of, of the people who are going to be using the information um, to do so in an appropriate way. I really liked your anecdote um, about, uh, about that tool that was developed, um, not for the purpose of making automated decisions, but for the purpose of empowering the decision maker with the information that they can use in that school setting, in that case, to, um, to get the best outcome for, uh, for the students. Um, and that, the success that, would, that, you, that uh, you reported on that was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I've got a little bit to share uh, as well from, from the CS side um, with, about what we've been doing of late. Um, I might see if I can capture the, uh, the screen share. Cool. Um, so, uh, so I just wanted to kind of open with a little bit about our philosophy um, as an organization, uh, our approach, if you like, to, uh, to data science and machine learning. I'm always a little bit nervous about um, using uh, the term artificial intelligence. I, I think um, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of expectation attached to us like artificial intelligence that is sometimes exciting and sometimes terrifying. Um, <laughs> I think both of those are, are attitudes that um, I'd rather temper um, than encourage. Uh, but yeah, so our, our data science efforts um, are really, uh, you know, we want to bring data science um, into the social sector as much as we can, you know, much like Sarah is doing uh, at the Innovation Lab, we're um, brilliantly aligned in that regard. Um, and our kind of attitude towards it is that 
um, as a as a as a platform, as an online platform that's all about uh, bringing information to people on the ground, doing the work in communities. Um, the best way that we can think to do that is to answer complex questions as best we can using the data science, analytical, um, sometimes machine learning techniques that we've got available um, in our toolkit um, to answer those complex questions and then publish those. Um, in as broad and, and, and as much generality as we possibly can, make that information available to people in a way that's easy um, to then interrogate that information and, and find the answers that are meaningful and useful to them from amongst that broad collection. Um, you can see a handful of the different, uh, handful of different uh, estimates and, and collections of that kind that we've produced um, over the time that we've been running. Uh, the most recent, um, well, one of, the, one of the collections that had a bit of um, interest recently as it was used as part of the, uh, the blueprint uh, for giving uh, that was launched by Philanthropy Australia uh, earlier this week is the Intergenerational Transfer of Wealth Estimate by SA2. Um, so that's a, that's a foundational piece that's informing um, a lot of policy at the moment around um, the future of structured giving um, and is also really useful for a lot of community foundations to get an estimate for what that transfer is gonna look like and, and build a case for an endowment. Um, the giving index is an attachment to that or was, if you like, um, inspired by that work to also paint a picture of the, uh, the engagement at the community level with philanthropy and, and the concept of giving and, and engagement with, um, with giving time and money. Um, we've got a population forecast, um, which is uh, forecasting uh, the movement of populations by age um, across that population pyramid for a location. Um, the similar communities models is one of the earlier ones that we created. Uh, right when we got started working with um, the community in Greater Shepparton with um, Lisa McKenzie at the Greater Shepparton Lighthouse Project. I think I saw her among the attendees. Um, hi, Lisa, how are you? Um, that model is designed essentially to, uh, to help the community of Shepparton find uh, other communities that are like theirs, um, you know, with respect to a handful of um, intuitive uh, social themes and factors, things like um, language backgrounds and cultural backgrounds, things like distributions over age and gender, indigenous representation, um, and then socioeconomic factors like the, the CIFA indices, um, industries uh, and occupations of employment and so forth. And so that's a really powerful model. It's also being used by, um, by quite a few policymakers around the country, which is cool. Um, and we've also done some work as well, I should say, for policymakers around, um, around vulnerability, particularly to do with, uh, and throughout the pandemic, um, we had the privilege of working with the New South Wales Department of Analy uh, Data Analytics Centre, um, and subsequently with the Data Analytics Centre and the ACT as well, um, developing um, tools and, uh, and indices that they could use to, um, to be able to understand better uh, what the distribution of vulnerability on a variety of different um, dimensions are. Uh, regionally. Um, so this is a little bit about that um, intergenerational transfer of wealth estimate. Um, as I said, the idea is that uh, we, were, we, were, we were introduced to this concept by, uh, by the organization, the Interal Hands Foundation in the northeast of Victoria, um, in, the, in the township of Wangaratta, the community foundation who wanted to know, um, you know, hey, look, we're a regional town. Uh, we're not an urban center. Uh, we don't have the biggest population, um, you know, nobody would necessarily expect for there to be an enormous amount of wealth necessarily available for community foundations to, um, to really take root and, and, um, and be able to make a case for an endowment. But, um, you know, really, what is that, you know, is that true? Uh, what does the real um, household wealth look like in our area? And, you know, what kind of a story could we tell if we could encourage, um, you know, as they're saying now, 5% of, uh, of households to consider leaving 5% of their estate to an endowment and reinvest that back into the community. Um, what could that look like? So we built, um, we built an estimate, essentially it's a, it's a population model overlaid with uh, some local estimates of household net worth um, evolved over time to project, project out that transfer of wealth within households. Um, so that's from generation to generation in five year increments right up to 2065. Um, and so that, uh, that asset is available within SEER, again, as part of the suite of assets for uh, opportunity to be able to uh, learn and tell stories. Um, the next piece that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about is our work um, looking at the uh, SEER giving index and, uh, and some of the motivating questions behind that index. 
Um, again, this was part of um, part of the discussion that we had ongoing with um, with Philanthropy Australia as they were coming up with some of the foundational ideas for the blueprint. Um, one of the questions that came up that arose was, uh, you know, is there what does the engagement within a community look like? And and where we say engagement, we mean not just necessarily people, you know, giving in a financial sense, um, but also potentially also volunteering their time and. You know, is there a relationship even between those two things? Are people more likely to donate money um, if they're also donating time? Um, the idea being that if there is a mutual correlation between these factors, then there's the potential for us to develop an index um, based on a variety of different features that would describe the engagement at a community level with giving um, of time and of money. Um, and so can we uh, identify those gener the most generous places around Australia um, that you know might represent a big opportunity for um, for uh, for people in that regard. Um, so a little bit of the data science, I guess, behind that piece, we did what's called um, a weighted uh, least squares regression analysis. Um, so what you can see on the chart there, each of the each of the little speckly dots on that chart is um, is a community representative of, of a community. The size of the dot. Um, is scaled with the size of the population in that community. And these are all SA2s. So those are suburbs, if you like, um, from all around, all around Australia. Um, and the location of that community on the chart in the horizontal direction is uh, the person's undertaking voluntary work for an organizational group, which is this sort of ABS technical definition of volunteering. Um, so the horizontal axis is the rate of volunteering in that community. And in the vertical axis, we've got the rate of giving um, where people are reporting the uh, taxable donations in their tax returns um, normalized against the working population for that area. So in the vertical direction, the rate of giving. Um, so what we were looking for is a relationship between these two things. Um, you know, the, the strongest possible relationship you could imagine would be all of the dots clustered nice and neatly around the diagonal line that goes from the bottom left to the top right. Um, but what we in fact found was that there was a relationship um, with very high confidence, we can say that that relationship is positive. So that is to say, in fact, that um, where you have communities that are uh, volunteering their time, they're more likely to, to be donating money as well. And in fact, um, from communities all around Australia, every additional 10% in the rate of volunteering appears to uh, correspond to an additional 3.5% um, in the rate of giving. So that's an interesting response. Um, it would indicate... Uh, there's potentially some myth busting around that. There are some, there's a sort of an intuitive sense that I had, I suppose, that I'll sort of confess to having had um, to, begin, to begin with at the outset of this, that, you know, you might find a bit of a trade-off that uh, communities that where you had high rates of volunteering, those people might feel as though they didn't need to give financially because of their rate of volunteering, or perhaps they were volunteering because they didn't have the capacity to give. Um, in a monetary sense, it turns out, um, that's not necessarily true. It turns out that there is a strong, there's a, there's a positive correlation between these things. They vary um, together. Um, we've colored the, the dots on that chart as well, according to the CIFA uh, decile. So uh, the CIFA being the socioeconomic index for areas, and this is the index of economic resources variant of that family of indices. Um, so that color reflects, if you like, um, the best guess that the, uh, the BABS has in this case about the wealth um, within that community, the relative financial affluence of the community. And so what you can see there as well is that um, that's another positive correlate. It would tend to be, um, as you would expect, that uh, wealthier areas tend to be um, engaged in higher rates of donating um, to charities um, that are being reported in their tax. And then again, you know, those areas which have a high rate of giving um, also tend to have a higher rate of volunteering. So that was an interesting result. Um, and um, the next sort of uh, step, I guess, in that was to isolate those top three C for deciles. So within those wealthiest communities, um, in fact, that relationship between volunteering and giving um, gets a little bit stronger. So here in, in this case, um, every additional rate, 10%, uh, uh, every additional 10% in the rate of volunteering corresponds to an additional 4% rate of giving among those, um, those top three decile, uh, top three C for decile communities. Um, so as I said, the idea behind that was to be able to assemble those, uh, those various correlating factors together into what we call the SEER giving index. Um, the idea being that that's an index which will 
speak to um, the, the, the relative degree of engagement at a community level with giving, um, you know, uh, either of uh, uh, money or of time. Um, and again, now that's available as well in the SEER platform um, as, a, as an asset that communities can draw on to understand uh, within the region that they're interested in, where the real pockets of opportunity might be, um, and more broadly, what the, what the, uh, what the opportunity looks like um, more widely than that. Um, a little bit about the SEER community model. I'm keeping my eye on the time because I know I don't want to keep people any longer than 2 p.m. So I've only got 10, 10 or so more minutes. Um, Kat, um, what we might do potentially, if you wouldn't mind, could we launch the second poll now? Um, and I'll get everybody to drop into the chat any questions or remind people to drop into the chat any questions that they might have at any time. And I'll, um, I'll answer those questions as we go, perhaps, so, so, so as to not run over time. Um, there we go. Wonderful. Thank you, Kat. Um, so feel free to respond to that poll, everybody, and I'll, um, I'll carry on with um, just talking a little bit more about the similar communities model. Um, I mentioned it briefly up front as well, but you can see across the bottom here, those are the various factors that we've um, built into uh, the similar communities model so far. Um, I should mention, you can see the URL up the top there seadata.com.au forward slash similarity dash model. If you want to jump onto that URL, um, you can play with a live model that we have built into our website where you can put into focus at the top there. Um, you can see the example that's been put into focus is Burke. Um, and the, the results that we're showing in these two charts on the left side here is the top 10 towns that are most similar to Burke with respect to each of those factors combined. Um, so the most similar um, town to Burke is Walgett, uh, followed by Coonamble and so forth. And then on the right hand side, um, you know, just those towns from within the same state or territory um, that are most similar. So what's really great about this model, I guess, is a very first part is that it tends to return uh, localities that are right next door, neighboring LGAs, if you like. The model doesn't know anything about where these places are located, but it just so happens that neighboring towns, as you'd expect, tend to have similar demographic uh, and social factors. So that's uh, a nice bit of validation. Um, and again, so those areas that um, the community of Burke, for example, might choose to look to, uh, to understand where there are initiatives uh, that might be working to address some of the, um, some of the, the things that Burke would like to address um, as well. Uh, so as I said, it's being used as well um, uh, by a variety of different policy makers. Here we can see um, an example output from within the SEER platform. Uh, this is some work that we built for the Department of Social Services um, to support their uh, Stronger Places, Stronger People initiative. Uh, Mildura is one of the communities that's being funded through that initiative. And on the left side here, that output for the Department of Social Services was where are the communities that are like Mildura from all around Australia? Um, that, you know, if it's working in Mildura or if there's something that's working in Mildura, maybe we can look to some of these other locations to fund as well. Or if there's something that's working for these other locations, maybe we can recommend that um, to Mildura um, to, to assist with the community there. And on the right hand side, you can see is, um, is the other SPSP communities and a comparison between Mildura and those other SPSP communities. So you can see that uh, from among those communities, Burnie and Rockhampton would tend to be the two most similar communities to Mildura compared to others like Barclay, Burke and Logan who might be different to them um, in certain social factors that, um, that are interesting. Uh, so I can see the poll results have come through. The question here is which data capability are you most interested in learning about? Um, and I can see that there's a dead heat uh, between the last couple of options here. So I wonder if, I hope, I'm, I hope that everyone can see this. It says attendees are now viewing the poll results, so that's good. Um, reporting and visualizing and telling data stories is super important um, and learning optimization and taking action also super important. Um, so yeah, uh, couldn't agree more. Um, I think we touched on, on that a little bit earlier, Sarah, and that's, um, that's fantastic to hear everybody um, responding that way. Thank you. Um, cool. So um, the last couple of slides that I'll touch on before we wrap up, um, the population forecast model, as I said, this is a what we call an autoregressive model. So it's a neural network architecture. Um, autoregressive means that each time it makes a prediction, you can feed that prediction back to the back into the input of the model um, to get it to output for you the next uh, the next time step. So in this case, the first 
output was what's the population going to look like in the 2021 census that's just about to take place. Um, we can feed that population back into the model and get the output for what's the population going to look like at 2026 and then 2031 uh, and so forth. On the right hand side, you can see some of the results um, in terms of the, um, the uh, data that's fed into the model in green and the predictions that are made in red for a couple of example communities there. And that asset again is available in SEER for people to browse and, and understand what, uh, what our expectation is of uh, how these uh, populations are going to evolve. It's super interesting um, for things like planning services, um, you know, and, uh, and anticipating the needs of your, of your population that you might be serving. Um, so the last thing that I'll just mention very quickly before we wrap up is that, um, and this is something that's coming out of the R&D lab in SEER at the moment, um, we've been fascinated by this idea of how we can use um, our, uh, our data that we've been accumulating about, uh, you know, what people have been asking about, searching for, um, where people are located, um, and the kinds of themes that they want to explore to design an algorithm that will predict and recommend uh, insights to people through the SEER platform. So we're calling that Smarter Insights um, using machine learning and AI. It's in beta at the present moment, so it'll be rolled out. You'll, you'll, uh, you'll get a view um, of what that looks like and how it's going to work uh, very soon, so stay tuned. Um, I think we've got uh, a little bit of a, a sneak peek at one of the very early sketches, so this is quite low fidelity. Apologies. Um, or please, you know, bear with us as we refine what the look and feel might be. Um, but essentially, it will, it will look like something like this, where we've got, um, you know, your location might be something that you save within the platform, um, and we're able to recommend to you, hey, here are a handful of things, perhaps, that we recognize are particularly interesting to you, based on what we understand you're interested in, um, perhaps interesting because others um, have been have been searching for this uh, type of information as well, and also perhaps interesting because um, you know this appears to be a statistic which is a standout. Um, you know that your community stands out with respect to other communities on this particular domain or or or, or, uh, or way. So um, yeah, I think we've uh, we've just pulled in on time. I, I hope that uh, I hope that that was interesting for everybody. Um, again, if, uh, if anybody has any questions that they wanted to leap in with or, or that they might have run out of time to ask, um, by all means, follow up with myself. I'll say thank you again so much, Sarah, for your, uh, for your presentation. It was really interesting hearing about your work, um, as it always is. And um, yeah, so uh, thanks, everybody, for, for coming along. Um, look forward to catching up with you all individually or uh, when we see you next time. And have a wonderful afternoon.